that you understand how just how high it is and how much the elevation change is. But a, a beautiful setting, and as we get ready for what should be another great group two, as we mentioned, this is where it all began, really, for this part of the world when it comes to road racing and circuit racing. I say road racing because that's how it started. Back in the early 50s, um, California ran races uh, around the streets of Pebble Beach just across the way. That's long before Laguna Seca was even built. So back in those days, um, there were no real circuits. Most of the racing was done on um, either defunct or current airports, uh, local airports. That's where people had to run because there was nowhere else to actually run these very fast cars. Uh, and they would do uh, some street races. They would close the streets down and, and uh, have a weekend of Concourse Elegance and uh, racing around those streets. And then bit by bit, they decided that obviously that was a little too dangerous for the likes of some of these very fast cars that you're looking at right now. And so they said, look, let's build a circuit. And then where? Because they needed to stay in Monterey. They wanted to stay close by the peninsula. And there was an old army depot right here in Laguna Seca, which means in Spanish, dry lake. Uh, and so there was a nice basin, if you like, uh, an empty lake, and that helped the sound as well because these hills are full of some really nice houses, so they didn't want to make it too noisy, and it really sort of suited them to come out here to Laguna Seca, and off they began, and they worked with the local community and the local council to make things uh, as appropriate as possible, and that all began in 1957. And so these cars that you're looking at, which is 1940. 8 to 1955 and 19 and that sports cars and racing cars and 1947 to 1956 production cars in group 2 um, is where it all began for racing here in Laguna Seca and here on the California coast uh, meanwhile Sonoma was building up so too Riverside and a few others uh, and therefore racing began and what was interesting is that so much of the cars that were involved in those early days were actually cars from Europe like the Jaguar, and in fact, it was a Jaguar XK120 that won the first race in the hands of Phil Hill, the American who went on to become the first American F1 world champion. So this group, which starts us off today, is absolutely one of the most appropriate ways to start the day, and an ugly way. I love these cars, late 50s. <coughs> in terms of post-war production of cars, production cars was growing. The interest in racing, therefore, was growing. As I mentioned, tracks were being built. And it was not a heyday, but it was not far off. Uh, it was post-war, people were coming out, people were spending money, people were trying to um, stretch their legs a little bit and enjoy the luxuries of life after what had been a very tough World War II. A lot of the technology used in World War II was bought and uh, used in the engines and the cars that were designed in that era as well. So what have we got on display? We've got uh, some Porsches, we've got some Jaguars, we've got the old Triumph TR2, that was uh, just probably as popular as the Jaguar at the time. We have an Aston Martin from 1954, a DB2 Mark 1, uh, and that's a black one, John Jonathan Kitchen driving that. And I'm gonna keep a lookout for that, because that's a beauty. Um, we have a Ray Type A, uh, we have the old Elva, very popular here, so the likes of the Devon and the Elvas were all there to take on. Uh, the Jaguar, there's the Jaguar of James Alder, a good friend of mine from Reno, Nevada. He is a perennial entry to the historic events. In fact, uh, I want to say he's done over, well, 13 seasons of historic racing in that car. Uh, absolutely glorious, and he drives it from Reno, Nevada, as they would have done in the day, and that's an important thing to remember. These are all production cars, road cars, uh, and so, as you can see, with the number plates on. so. Back in the day, uh, if you wanted to go racing, you went on a Saturday or Sunday, but you drove your car to the track and maybe changed tires, maybe, but uh, that was about it. Maybe tighten the suspension, um, but uh, really, it, that's how racing uh, was pervaded in the mid-50s here in California. Here's the famous corkscrew for the first time there, and look at that jump, that leap of faith almost, because it really is, if you've ever been here in any form of car or motorcycle, it's really, your heart goes right in your mouth the way you drop off that crest. 
and you're right at the top of the hill as well uh, and so it is the highest point of the Laguna Seca uh, landscape and you can look right over the Monterey Peninsula and down to the sea from there uh, but you don't have a lot of time to uh, look at the view because you're diving down the hill very quickly so we are going to form up two by two so to speak and uh, this time yesterday in practice and uh, in their qualifying race, Chris McAllister in his D-type. Uh, he was the man of the moment yesterday, fastest man out there. And Dom Pepperdine in his Baldwin Mercury special, also one to watch. John Budabon in his Jaguar Parkinson special. There's another California iteration, taking a Jaguar and Dom Parkinson putting his touches on it and making his own version. Where we go then, it's group two here at Velocity Invitational, day two. Rewide into Andretti Curve. Doesn't get any better. Absolutely glorious. And away we go into turn three for the first time. There's car three. That's John Budabon, the man I mentioned in that Jaguar Parkinson special. 3.8 litre. And Dennis Adair in that Elvermart one from 1955. And of course, racing cars was a big social fad as well. So Monterey with its uh, beaches and golf courses and so on, a very big part of being here. And obviously the military returning from World War II. And, uh, combination of these big heavy Jaguars really stealing the show certainly at the Pebble Beach races uh, early on and the likes of Phil Hill Sterling Moss coming over here in the early days of the Pebble Beach races to race one of those Jaguar XKs Briggs Cunningham in the CR2 in 1951 also raced these sorts of cars so it's a combination of the V8s from America and the British made Jaguars and Triumphs, TR2s, Morgans. We have got one Morgan out there from 1952. So the action fast and furious already. Uh, they start to, you'll see them put their hand signals out. It's a, it's a sort of gesture in historic racing uh, of, of letting each and every driver know that they are aware that you are coming through and which side you want them to pass. So as to avoid, obviously with these priceless cars, to avoid any uh, untoward accidents or crazy driving, uh, you, list, you literally see in your mirrors the man coming up to your left or right and just signal, say, hey, pass me on the left, pass me on the right, and then you're both aware of exactly where you need to be. Keep a look out for the 1949 Baldwin Mercury Special. Don Pepperdine driving that. He was one of the faster guys yesterday. And it is Rob Manson leading the way at the moment. Rob Manson in the 25C. Uh, that's a Tatum GMC Special. Now, on my original guide here, David Zerlingden was due to drive that car, but it looks as though Rob Manson, I think he wasn't here yesterday, and so Rob, who is well known in the historic world, is going to be driving that car today. John Budabam, the man I mentioned earlier in the Jaguar Parkinson special, he's in second, and Don Pepperdine in that 77C, the Baldwin Mercury special from Carmel, is in third. Chris McAllister, who you'll see, I think, a lot of over the day in fourth position in the number seven uh, Jaguar D-Type. Watch out for Dennis Adair coming through as well in that 814. The Elvermart one as we look at the 15. And uh, just trying to see where that number 15 slots in. Ah, that's Marcus Bicknell in the Manning Street Special. There you go. So we should get plenty of views of that as well. Got a full day of action for you as we did yesterday. 
really looking forward to bringing you some of the most beautiful cars in the world, frankly. Uh, it really is something to behold, to be honest. Uh, it's not often you get this gathering of so many priceless cars. Uh, we don't, we don't it's, it's almost a rude thing to go into the actual cost or price of how these cars are sold and bought, but I can assure you, having spoken to the organizers, uh, there's a fair few million out there, and some of which uh, you just can't put a price tag on. Uh, some of the Ferraris out there, uh, we're talking upwards of 50, 60, 70 million dollars. So that's just one example. I won't go into the details because it's rude, um, or at least not everybody wants their price tag named, but I can assure you that what you're looking at is truly remarkable when it comes to the cars on display. And the other thing you should remember while watching these group cars is that they are all authentic. These are exactly as they were raced in period. So in the 50s, this is how they raced. These were the colors they raced in. And they, they are not allowed to put uh, brand new brakes or uh, ABS or any, anything that is modern besides the roll bar and besides perhaps a hands device for the neck for safety and of course a modern helmet. Um, that's about it. The brakes, the suspension, the tires even are all as they were back in the 50s. And that in, in itself, if you think about it, if you have a washing machine from the, from the 70s alone, it's hard enough to find parts. So imagine a racing car that you're having to race around and find parts for. And that's something we'll discuss as the weekend goes on, is how on earth do they keep these cars fettled and going uh, as well as they do, uh, given uh, that they are so old, so many of them. And there's my friend, the number 33, there he is. Good to see him out there. This, of course, James Alder, who I mentioned earlier in that uh, XK120 Jaguar from 1952, uh, an OTS, an open top. And yes, he does, there's the roll bar I was mentioning, so that's the only adage to him, but that's an original, and he's raced that some 300 plus events around America, from Seattle, to Washington, California, and like I said, he's based in Reno, Nevada, and drives it from his garage. And he says, I said, what's the drive like? And he said, well, as long as it doesn't rain over the mountains, I'm okay. <laughs> and I don't, I can understand that. And I said, do you have any problems? What if you break down? And he said, well, that can happen. And he said, but people are so friendly along the way and they're so interested in the car. And when he's on the freeway, uh, they all kind of pick their horns and, and wave at him. So. The journey is just as, as big as the event for him, and it's uh, great to see him here, currently in eighth position, James Alder. He's gonna come in the booth later today and regale us, I'm sure, with some stories of all. Rob Manson then leading the way in the 25C. And I think the reason why Rob is not on my leaderboard is because yesterday I don't think he ran the car, so. Now he's back, he's up and running. There's the 55. It's the Chevrolet Mistral from 1955. Wesley Abendroff at the wheel. Absolutely beautiful sights and sounds of these wonderful machines. And as the day goes on, we've got quite a few special moments for you to savor including Formula One coming up. McLaren are here in full gusto with their modern Formula One cars. And for them, they're historic pieces. But of course, to us, they're about as modern as they get at an historic event because what we're talking mid nineties, um, 2005, I think one, one is we've got a, a Senna and a, a Prost car from 1990. But as we look at that 19, uh, that number 55, the Chevrolet Mistral. 55, the D-Type Jaguar was another one that was used a lot in racing. I think that's one just behind him, actually. The Aston Martin. The Tantum GMC Special, that's another one. The Curtis Dodge was also a member of this era. 
Uh, and going back to that Jaguar XK120, it debuted in 1948 at the 1948 London Motor Show as a test bed and display for the new Jaguar XK engine DOHC in line six. And it caused quite a sensation and persuaded Jaguar founder and chairman William Lyons to put the car in production. And as of May 1949, um, it was tested and proved that it would reach up to speeds of over 130 miles an hour, making it the fastest production car in the world, which is interesting because we have some of those here today of the modern versions, like the uh, Zinger and the Venvo, you'll see, and a Hennessy in action later today. So back in the day, these were the fastest production cars, but of course, that's a long time ago. Now, Chris McAllister, no surprise in that number seven, hitting the front. Just getting ahead of Rob Manson. Chris, in that D-type Jag, actually took victory here. He, uh, he's based in um, Indianapolis. And there's that Manning Street special. You can see them working the wheel too, larger wheels back in the day. I was talking to one of the drivers yesterday about how, <laughs> how do you get used to driving an old car with these bigger wheels uh, and effectively then getting back into your regular car. And in his case, he was driving a Porsche, a modern day Porsche. And obviously <laughs> it's quite some difference. But physically, you can see how much he's physically, there's no uh, power steering. Uh, absolutely not. So you can see they are working it. It, it is a, an upper body workout for sure. In fact, every muscle in your body is being used because your whole body is moving. Look how they lean into the car at each and every corner. Absolutely splendid. Still early morning. We're waiting for the fog to clear off the Monterey Peninsula and hopefully give us some sunshine. Because when that mountainside in the background lights up it's absolutely spectacular you're watching our first group group two our feature race chris mccallister leading the way from rob manson john bodebam in third don pepperdine in fourth position at the moment and marcus bicknell there's that seattle just going through shot. Another quite unique car in this group. I mentioned that Jaguar Parkinson Special. It's built by Joe Thrall, and Don Parkinson, uh, and Phil Hill was Parkinson's brother-in-law. I mentioned Phil Hill being the winner of the first ever Pebble Beach race. And uh, that Parkinson, the Jaguar Parkinson Special was built in uh, Los Angeles successfully raced uh, to its pre present configuration for two years before replacing with the Jaguar C-Type. The car was restored by John Budabam, who's out there right now. In 1983, and it continues to be competitive in its class. And yes, top three, John Budabam at the moment. So that Jaguar Parkinson Special has a storied history and John continuing to enjoy his day. the 1953 excuse me yeah 1953 Jaguar C-Type smoking a bit but uh, not to a distressful I think that's just a mix issue rather than anything else yeah it's just under as he drops down a gear it just uh, a little bit bit smoky but uh, certainly not a problem and he's not laying anything down on the track that's always a worry. Uh, we had some oil down yesterday, and uh, you have to be very careful with these cars because given the tires and so on, they can easily go off track. And we don't want to uh, break anything into Ron's corner, as I call it. And look at the 44 chasing him hard. Great stuff. That 44 is a 1955 Hangerman Chrysler Special. 
And got a bit of grunt up the hill. Will he take the 21? We'll soon find out. Ah, just looking ahead to the day ahead. Coming up after Group 2, uh, we'll go on to Group 3. So we'll sort of stay in uh, the next period, if you will. And then from there on, uh, definitely at local time, 9.55, the ragtime races, you don't want to miss that. Over 100-year-old cars, and they're putting on quite an exhibition. And one that is definitely worth a watch if you've never watched it. But as we speak, it's the uh, Jaguar D-Type from 1955 of Chris McAllister leading the way. Coming out of the final corner. Two laps to go then. And that D-Type doing the business. Now, it's interesting because they've got different numbers for what I've got, Dan. Um, but I've got Chris in this car as the 7. But as you can see yourself, it's got the 23 and the 7 on. So he's got both cars on, both numbers on. It doesn't matter. It's definitely Chris McAllister. And it's definitely the Jaguar D-Type. Rob Manson had led this race. We've got a unique commentary position here as well, which is purposely built so that we can try to get as many drivers in here to uh, regale you with their stories as the day goes on. And we're right above the pre-grid, right with the crowd, if you will. Uh, so we're seeing what they're seeing, and it really is an absolutely eyeful of iconic cars. And uh, the way they've laid it out is very uh, Goodwood-esque. Oh, a bit of close racing here. It's the 77, the Baldwin Mercury special. Don Pepperdine at the wheel from Carmel Valley. And then that Tatum GMC special I mentioned a moment earlier. Tatum GMC special built between 1952 and 53 by Charles Chuck Tatum in Stockton, California. Tatum designed the tubular chassis which sits on the Ford truck suspension components and the GMC inline six cylinder engine was originally from the local fire truck. Can you believe that? Wayne Engineering, a Southern California manufacturer specializing in GMC and Chevrolet inline six cylinder race motors, supplied a highly modified version and in 1954 and 55 that featured all of the firm's speed equipment including the famous 12 valve cross flow cylinder head. All the aluminium body, uh, or it's an all aluminium body, fabricated by Jack Hagerman. You've seen that name already in another one of the cars in Haywood, California. So a lot of these cars that you may see out here in these mid-50s Group 2 were effectively put together here in California and raced at the famous Pebble Beach races. In fact, when you come into Laguna Seca, you'll see some of the trees uh, literally painted with white bottoms so they've got white paint on the bottom of the trees and that is an homage if you will a little nod to those early pebble beach road races where they painted the trees so that you could see where the line of the racetrack was and hopefully avoid those trees didn't often ha didn't always happen but uh, that is the reason why we're here at laguna seca thankfully so chris McAllister on his way now as uh, the 25 and the number three go head to head for the last time in the final lap here in group two. And like I said, I'm hoping to get a couple of the drivers from this group after they finish. Come and join me and talk about their experience out here at Laguna. Can't be easy in these colder conditions mid-October. It's always a worry when the track is cold and uh, the weather is cold to get those tires up to temperature. Well, they've done a pretty good job of keeping it all clean. Ah, somebody's just gone a little bit of grass trucking there. Now that's at the exit of five, I think. Yeah, uh, as they head up the hill. And so a little bit of, little bit of uh, desert tracking, as it were. Uh, 
And there you go, the finish done and dusted. Well done to Chris McAllister, just crossing the line there, just ahead of the number 31. That 31 and XK120, the green one, that's Bill Rookledge in the green version of the uh, Jaguar. Somewhat un unwieldy as a race car, but uh, when the likes of Sterling Moss were driving him and then racing him with Phil Hill at Pebble Beach, I think that's what uh, kind of uh, got everybody interested. So that concludes our Group 2 uh, coverage for Velocity Invitational. Our first group up today.